Okay, so I have been planning on this for a couple of days now, or even like a few weeks, um, when I'm when I'm just gonna start back to making up videos. And this would have been a plan I could have done back in January when I turned 20. Um, but because, of course, since I didn't get a new laptop um, until two weeks ago, um, that's why I, you're finally getting some a new top 10 list that I hadn't done since my Oscar movies of 2017, my top 10 ones. And in kind of honor of my 20 years in life, I am going to kind of talk about um, childhood movies that I had grown up with. Um, of course, everyone had a specific movie growing up, whether it be, of course, an animated film from Disney, or Pixar, or from DreamWorks, or even some live-action films that might not be as good when you look at them nowadays. But I had this in a while in depth, and since the coronavirus outbreak has been going through throughout the Keystone State, and since Governor Wolf declared massive shutdowns on odd companies, that's why you're going to get a little bit more content from me, a little bit just for the rest of the month, but this is definitely one of them that I'm immediately going to do this while um, the reviews are on hold right now. So, with that being said, let us begin. Now, I did thought of having some honorable mentions um, in the list, um, but what I've decided to arrange it was like, based on specifically how many times I could have watched the movie, or like a specific scene, but it's also like um, the bonus features that I have through these DVDs. Um, and some of these movies then I hopefully one day will plan to upgrade these to Blu-rays. Um, some of them may be on hold, like some of them are on the list, but um, so I'm gonna see what it is because like there could have been like films like Ratatouille, Wally, uh, the first Cars, uh, Jonah and Veggie Tales movie. Um, there are a couple on this list that I can't really think of at the top of my head, but those are four I know that did not make it on the list. And you're also going to expect a lot of Pixar movies on this list because since I'm in the 2000, I was born in 2000, so um, you're going to expect a lot of Pixar movies on this list. So just keep your heads on the end. And we're already starting up with the Pixar movie at number ten now. I, years, like, now today, I wouldn't consider it, like, one of the best from the company, um, and this is one of their oldest films, but, uh, it's kind of a classic, like, throughout the days of childhood, um, uh, my number 10 is Monsters, Inc., and, um, this was, of course, the directorial debut of Pete Docter, um, who would later on, of course, would direct Up and Inside Out, and, of course, being the director of the upcoming new Pixar movie, Soul, since Onward had was just released earlier this month. And um, the movie itself, um, from what I can remember it when I was a kid, I did watch this a bunch of times. Um, but it was mainly specifically the bonus features is what really keep my eye on since it did came with, this was a two dicks collector's edition. And um, what did the second do dicks had like you got the short film Mike's New Car, you got the short for the birds, but there was of course the outtakes, which was the third and last time Pixar would do bloopers and outtakes, the other two being um A Bug's Life and Toy Story Two. Um and also um when they introduced Pixar's new studio in Anaheim, which is their current one as of today. Like many behind the scenes stuff is what really kept my eye throughout this movie. Not much on itself. Um, but I did have an appreciation to a little bit with this movie, like with the performances from Billy Crystal and John Goodman, kind of almost like being a great duo with this and Monsters University, but of course, no, I can't top the duo of Tom Hanks and Tim Allen for, for Pixar specifically. Um, as for anything else, like just looking at this, but I didn't really have much of a connection to, um, this movie, of course, nowadays, because... There is a couple of issues that I do have with it, like, obviously, one of the main people consider probably one of the weakest aspect is Boo, of course. Um, but how they did uh, back in 2001 when they released this, it's quite an interesting journey how um, when after when now the then-behaved John Laster um, was, when 
P. Doctor took the second, become the second director for the company. This was a great start for new creative directors, and who is now currently the newest chief creative officer for Pixar. So that's why it's my number ten. All right, at number nine, <laughs> this might be kind of a bit of an embarrassing one to say the least. This is probably the one I think in this entire list that has got not so good reviews by critics, a lot of bad ones, but. I would now kind of consider it my, um, ro um, the room, it's, um, because it's so bad, but it's so entertaining to watch. Um, coming in from the year 2006, Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties. Alright, now, I'll be honest, I have not experienced personally with Garfield, and of course, yeah, he, as you guys know, um, Garfield was the first ever character I did for my Macy's Parade Balloon series. Um, and the movies themselves... Um, I kind of mentioned this a little bit in my commentary on it, but the first movie, when I first watched it, I really wasn't didn't took to it. And then when I fully revisited again years, um, years later, when I was uh, during my later year, half of the 2000s, I thought it was just, eh. Like... Of course, it's the um, origin story of Garfield and Odie meeting together, but this sequel is one of the most weirdest things that has happened. Like, of course, their owner, John, wanted to go to London to propose to Liz, who was going to Carlisle Castle. Um, and, of course, you got the double game story with, of course, Garfield, um, which is still surprising Bill Murray reprised his role for the sequel. I thought he would probably won't. Um... And, of course, Prince the Twelfth, voiced by Tim Curry. Um, it, like, it is, like, such a weird movie, to say the least. But it's just so funny how it is. And um, th there's not really much of the special features when it comes to this DVD. Um, but what it made me so interested, it was actually, you get two versions of the DVD here. You get the theatrical version of full screen, but... Now, in recent years, I usually would go with the widescreen version because it's an extended edition. And there are some more random scenes that are just so bad. Like like an entire pool party animal scene um, disturbing uh, Lord Dodges, uh, the villain of this film, um, was supposed to have a special tea time with um, a typical love interest he was actually after. Um, and Garfield and the other animals when took it over because that's what happened because Garfield was taken by um, Smithy the butler of, Buc of Carlisle Castle. I almost keep thinking it's Buckingham but it's not actually. Um, and of course John ended up taking the prince because Lord Dodgers throw prince into the river because he wants to take over the throne of the castle instead of a cat. Um, I know it seems weird but I feel like I've seen this before We've seen this before with the Aristocats, but the only difference is, is that Dodges is not Butler. He is actually, um, I believe, if I remember this, I haven't seen this in a while, the nephew of um, the, the lady of the um, the castle, uh, the Will. Like I, like I said, I haven't seen this in a while, but um, I know it's this is like so inaccurate to the source material of Garfield because Liz never smiles. and. Yeah, it's very interesting. Jennifer Love Hewitt. I think a lot of people kind of forgot that she actually exists. Uh, but Breckenmeyer um, has also been under the radar. Like, the last time I actually had a little experience was actually through the ABC show Designated Survivor, when it was on ABC before Netflix bought it, um, as um, President Kirkman's brother. So he kind of got a little bit of their recognition for um, myself. But I felt like that, like, this orange cover is just interesting but um yeah non-stop for the whole family well i could see why i kind of didn't enjoy it as a kid but and i kind of consider this my personal the room but it's been a while but it's just so bad it's fun to watch all right at number eight another pixar film and kind of an interesting way you go from pete doctor's debut with monsters inc to Andrew Stanton's debut with Finding Nemo. And, um, like Monsters, Inc., it wasn't the movie itself that really got me to much in this. It was, of course, once again, uh, the bonus features that actually came with this. Like, this was a two-dicks collector's edition, but this was very interesting because 
Disc 1, you got the widescreen version, and Disc 2, you got full screen version. Um, but just talking about the movie itself before I get into the um, how I really experienced this a lot of times I kid through the DVD. Um, yeah, I could see, like, I probably didn't enjoy it as much when I was a kid. Specifically, any of the scenes with Marlon and Dory when they were traveling. And all the only scenes I did watch for a while were um, the tanking scenes. And then years later, I have more of an appreciation to uh, both of the scenes of the perspectives of both Marlon and Nemo. Um, because it's an interesting adventure that Marlon and Dory had to go through to get to P. Sherman... I forget what it was. P. Sherman 42 Waddle Blay Sydney. I forget what it was, but um, that's what it is. And then, of course, you got the performances of Albert Brooks, um, Alexander Gould, Ellen DeGeneres, uh, Willem Dafoe, Allison Janning, um, Brad Garrett, uh, the late Joe Ramp, Des Jock. Um, like, there was also a couple other Australians, and even Andrew Santa, the director. Voice of Crush. Um, it's very interesting to have him in the front of the disc cover, and Nemo's not in this one. Uh, yeah, he's in, oh he he's only in the bottom of this DVD cover, but um, so yeah, like the Monsters Inc. It was mainly the DVDs bonus materials that I really took to the most. Um, it was disc two for a while, and they always had a lot of sneak previews, like they showed the sneak preview teaser for The Incredibles. Um, I know they also showed the trail for Home on the Range. And the home media release of the Santa Claus 2, which that was also another movie I could have really put on this list, but um, it was usually during the Christmas season I watched it. So that was that could be another honorable mention. Uh, but then, of course, you got the um, Exploring the Weave with Jean Michel Cousteau, Cousteau I meant, um, the short film Knickknack, uh, Mr. Ray's um, Encyclopedia, Fisher Raids, um, and Storytime for the Young, so like just of Nemo going to school. But then, Disc 1. Kind of got a little bit more interesting in it. I think it, this um, had one of the best audio commentaries because it was an audio visual commentary. Like, you get the commentary from director Andrew Stanton, co director Leon Grinchens, um, co writer Bob Peterson. And throughout the commentary, you get these um, visual clips, um, hips of how they made the movie. Um, which I do think it's this the Finding Nemo commentary on this DVD is definitely one of the best audio commentaries I've ever um, experienced with um, years later. But uh, during my second half as a kid, but all in all, I do think it is uh, ugly, entertaining, in a cool way. I'm just reading in the back of the DVD from this review, but definitely a, a classic in everyone's hands. Okay, so number seven, we actually have a um, tie in this one, and both of these films are kind of connected to one another, and um, they're kind of both in, based on the same materials, and um, it's very interesting that they're kind of different, because like Garfield and Tale of Two Kitties, it was, they had a lack of bonus features, but the movie itself were really talking to me, and... Obviously, I am talking about, of course, both. Actually, I'm gonna do this better than in a perfect way. Uh, the original 1971 William Walton the Chocolate Factory and Tim Burton's remake of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> I know. I know a lot of people really don't take to this remake as it is, and maybe some critics who liked it first might not like it now. Um, but yeah, obviously, of course. For a while, I was more dick to this film before I'm now more dick to the classic. Um, obviously, I have done a review of the classic film, so you can see that. That was kind of like my tribute to Gene Wilder, which I was still traumatized um, when he passed away on the first day of my um, junior year in high school. But um, I have stated my review, um, but I think since um, it's kind of a little bit of an outdated review, I'd say... Like, this is definitely one of my all-time favorite movies. It's such a beloved classic. Um, like, it's just a really great um, story. And everyone agrees, probably the best movie based on a Roald Dahl book. Even though Dahl himself was not a fan of this movie. Um, but the songs are amazing. Um, the characters are even likable. And, of course, Gene Wilder as Holy Wonka. 
And as for the um, Tim Burton movie, this was the one I watched a lot when I was a kid because it was the more recent one because I wasn't really into old classic cinemas at the time. Um, but this one had a lot of, to me when I was a kid. And like um, this Willy Wonka DVD that I had, it had a lack of bonus features. Um, but the thing is, when um, it comes to this DVD, it was more specific, of course, the movie itself. And I did kind of did talk to um, Freddie Highmore as Charlie, kind of like what Peter Armstrong did in the first movie. But, of course, I can see why he's kind of like a, a too of a Christian um, in this movie when you think about it. But it kind of makes sense because I always think in this remake, every time when he shares his chocolate to the family, I almost think like he is passing um, the body of Christ to his family. I know that seems weird in a religious way, but it kind of feels like it in The Last Supper. And I know it's weird because we're, in, um, as a Catholic person, I, it's weird for me to say that, but it kind of feels like that. Um, obviously, the songs, now looking at they're not really as strong as compared to the original, but they're kind of average. It's like Cheer Up Charlie, which is the only song in the original that no one likes. Um... And of course, I even got a recent experience with Freddy through The Good Doctor um, on ABC, which I'm kind of losing interest in a little bit just because um, it's kind of like getting way too predictable, even though um, the two-part season of finale is coming up and I heard they were new thing for a fourth season, so I'm going to stick on board with that um, because it's the only cable TV show I think I've watched nowadays, so... Um, but I'm very curious how um, that finale will be in two weeks. Well, the two-part finale, so to be precise, um, with the earthquake. But overall, with these remakes, uh, but not the remakes, these adaptations, I meant, um, I would stick with the original one, but this really took the place of my childhood. So, yeah, it's kind of a tie, but I love Willy Wonka. Okay, number six. Another Pixar film, <laughs> and um, it's A Bug's Life, um, the their second animated film, and of course the second one to be directed by John Laster. Um, obviously, um, unlike the, some of the previous Pixar movies, um, it was both the movie and the bonus features that really got me as a huge fan of this Pixar movie it is. I might apologize if the lighting here is not that um, great if it's blocking the cover of the DVDs, but it's a beautiful day in terms of temperature-wise. Um, not much it looks, but anyways, and kind of interesting, you can hear the sound of the birds, because that's what it kind of is when you feel like about this movie, because um, although, yeah, I do, con it, many people can consider it now one, not one of the best, because it does have that underdog story, um, and some people think Flick is not that interesting. Uh, but the voice casting is just what makes the movie so memorable for the, all these other characters. The amount of colors that it's using in the animation. Like, the circus bugs, for a while, was the only thing I watched a lot when I was a young kid. But now, years later, when I had more, when I was a little bit older, I had more appreciation to the movie. And the bonus features in Disc 2, my gosh. A lot of great behind-the-scenes materials that they actually did. And, of course, this was the first film to use the bloopers and outtakes. Um, like, I mean, it's kind of a classic, but it's now kind of like one of the most underappreciated Pixar movies since not a lot of people really would talk about some of their older works, and this is easily one of the films that they would not talk about, um, not just because of Laster as the director, but more specifically... Um, it's not a strong one compared to some of the current Pixar movies nowadays. Um, but, yeah. And, of course, as well as maybe with Kevin Spacey as Hopper here, but you can't change past events, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah. Um, this is definitely a classic of my takes. And these lovable creatures will live on forever. Now we're getting into the top five, and since I have been talking about a lot of Pixar movies, I actually do have an animated Disney movie on this list, and the only one from all Disney Animation Studios. Now you might be questioning, which one is it? Is it 
the classics like Snow White or Pinocchio is in any of the Renaissance films like Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, or is it um, like around the time what was popular was Lilo and Stitch? No. As a massive fan of this movie, and I think many people would agree with me that this was definitely a great film of my childhood, and I'm talking about The Emperor's New Groove. Boom, baby! <laughs> I don't want to speak out loud here right now because um, I've been talking for a while. But this is definitely one of the most underappreciated films that Disney has not been looking at nowadays. Because when they would even think about talking about any of the movies of the 2000s, they would only talk about Lilo and Stitch and The Princess and the Frog. Because, of course, during the first half of the 2000s, a lot of their hand-drawn movies were massively having box office flops and bombs everywhere and of course this was still when Michael Eisner was still CEO and then when um, Bob Iker um, took the position and bought Pixar and when Disney Animation had their new management they kind of fixed the hand-drawn problem even though they have not made a hand-drawn film since Winnie the Pooh back in 2011 but this is definitely one that Disney really should appreciate more because many people consider this as their funniest movie from their company and I can understand why. And of course, this is coming from Mark Dunnell, who directed Cat Stone Dance and later directed Chicken Little, which many people consider that the worst animated film from Walt Disney Animation Studios. But this is many people considered to be an underappreciation classic for my taste because, I mean, I cannot say how funny this movie is. Like, like the movie is just so hilarious from the characters to the amount of jokes it has. Um, like, many scenes that are in the movie. And, like, my personal favorite is, of course, the Mudka's Mean Heart scene. And seeing that this one emperor has to team up with a villager to just travel back to his palace to turn him to llama, but the whole journey itself being a comedy, what makes this movie so funny. Um, and having two villains, one that is and one that isn't, um, and this is probably considered probably Patrick Warburton's most memorable voice performance role. Because, of course, yeah, we all know him as now as Joe on Family Guy. Um, but, and kind of like, he has been, like, I believe on Space Chimps and the Hoodwink series. But, yeah, and this could also be considered David Spade's most memorable movie role ever. Because in recent years, of course, he has been in a lot of dumb Adam Sandler comedies. So yeah, I think this is definitely one that he really wants. And of course, knowing about years later what this originally was supposed to be, an Egyptian drama uh, musical, uh, Prince of the Poplar style, um, called Kingdom of the Sun, I did watch the uh, documentary of that, and it did focus a lot on Singh since his wife was the director of the movie, but I think that this final result of this ended up being probably better than what it was originally planned. Even though it would have been interesting to see what would have been the original attempt of Kingdom of the Sun. Um, but The Emperor's New Groove is definitely one that it's a master class, a classic I meant. Um, I almost said a masterpiece. Like, I could say it's a masterpiece. Um, yeah, it, it kind of is a masterpiece. Um, but, like, definitely one of the best from Disney Animation without a doubt. Number four is the only DreamWorks movie that is on this list. And you might know which one I'm talking about, but the question is, is it that one or is it the other? And I'm talking about Shrek 2. Shrek 2, of course, this one I had more connection to it with the first film because when I watched the first film for the first time, I was not a fan of it. And, of course, years later, um, I did rewatch the first Shrek again, and honestly, I do think it's a bit overrated. Um, I didn't think it deserved the Oscar, not even Monsters. Yeah, so, interesting enough, I would have given it to Jimmy Neutron, honestly, um, for that Oscar. Um, but, what can I say about the sequel? This was a great follow-up, um, and probably even a better story of the entire world of Shrek, of, like, what happens after he received his happily ever after where he has to confront Fiona's parents uh they find out that she still has the curse of being an ogre the fairy godmother and her son prince charming and not happy a bit and of course they get, shrek and donkey of course got a new um partner with them with puss and boots 
who was supposed to kill Shrek, by the way, but that failed, because, of course, Shrek is big. Um, and this movie is just so great on how it is. Like, from its visuals back then, to the amount of humor it has, to the great memorable scenes it had, and even um, the bonus features, uh, some of them I usually follow, like the DreamWorks Kids section, and... Like, obviously, since this is a childhood movie of mine. And, of course, the Far, Far Away Idol. Um, of course, which was a parody of American Idol and getting Simon Cowell in this, which is very interesting how you look like he was still American Idol. Now he's the judge of America's Got Talent, which kind of might get a little bit of bad reputation because of the recent controversy. But, yeah. Um, in terms of the second one here, of course... Um, the characters are definitely well likable here. A uh, fairy godmother, I think, is a well fantastic villain, um, and everything kind of explains to itself on how this sequel ended up becoming a perfect, great example of this. Um, I it's very debatable if I would give this to this or have The Incredibles deserve that Oscar because they're both really great movies in one another when you go to the Oscar lineup because there's no way Shark Tale has that, but. I feel like um, this really had more of a connection to me because I didn't watch The Incredibles until the second half of my childhood um, because this stuck with me a lot because um, it was just like these characters, like a follow-up to a great uh, film that I thought was kind of weak in the first film, but going from this, it's just perfect by all means. And if you're curious about my thoughts on the third one, um... I see why a lot of people don't like it, and I can actually understand, but it's been a while since I've seen Shrek the Third. I haven't even still watched Shrek Forever After or Puss in Boots. Um, but of course, I've done a history of Shrek in my Pacey Sprite series as well, so what a shock. I would be talking about this film here, so Shrek 2. Okay, so my number three is the only movie that I don't have a physical copy of. And the thing is, these top three movies all have connected to me through, actually, a VHS. And yes, of course, VHSs were still alive um, when I was a kid, of course, during the early 2000s. And even basically throughout until, like, right around when, like, recording, um, DVR recordings were a thing before um, we had the classic VHSs. And the this is the only one that I don't have because all three of the VHSs are gone, but I do have two, the top two DVDs, but I don't have this one as a DVD. And that is Digimon the Movie. Now, Digimon the Movie, I had the more connection, of course, with the VHS. Now, it's very interesting because my original username when I created this account back in 2010 was Brian Digimon Boy 2000 but I kind of grown out a little bit of anime like, because I was more of, like, Pokemon and Digimon, Digimon was kind of my thing. Um, and I, I did think the first season was actually pretty great. I believe I never finished the second season. Like, I don't remember when the last time I, uh, last episode I watched. But Digimon the movie was a very interesting one, how it is. Because, of course, it had the Angela Anaconda short, which I had no idea who she was until research later. Um... Years later, I meant. Um, and then, of course, you got that digi rap, which I can see why a lot of people didn't like it. And then you got three compilations of short films that were originally released in Japan, all combined into one. It's like a package film, like The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Um, and they all kind of, like, tell this big story of somewhat of the digi genesis, but more of, like, this American digi destined that they're going towards to. With Kari, Ty's little sister, as the narrator of the movie. Um, and it goes, of course, the first one being, like, sets around, take place before the events of the first season where Ty and Kari as little kids um, experiencing a Koromon, then later evolved to an Akamon, and then a big giant Greymon against a big Paragmon. Like, they were bigger when, like, when you actually watch the episodes, you are surprised how big they are when, um, compared to when they act, uh, their versions of Cormon and Agamon and Raymon is years later. Um, and then the second one, our war game, which I know that's the um, title for 
um, the original title for the Japanese version, uh, is the one that stick with me the most, because it did take place after the events of the first season. Like, the characters are a bit older, and, um, of course, there's this Digimon that is hacking the computer systems, and then the phone systems, and then here are the United States. Um, and, yeah, the dialogues might be weird, and especially with Ty's mom making some of the weirdest foods in the main English dub version, like beef jerky shakes, um, like, what else? Like, spinach cookies? <laughs> like, yeah, and Izzy thinks um, her, his mother's recipes are not that good. Um, but the battles were very interesting of how they had a battle through the internet of the foes systems with Tai and Izzy's Digimons, Agumon and Tentamon, and then later with Matt and TK's with Gabumon and Patamon. And then, of course, you got the Karamon evolving into an Infamon, and then Diaboramon. And you, I always kept thinking that Digimon is cheating through all those computer datas. Um, but it's very interesting how it is on how the animation was of the mix of hand-drawn characters in some, what of a two, a 3D world where it was. And I do think the animation in the second, in the, in the movies are not that bad. And by the way, one of the directors of that movie would later direct, uh, Mirai, which I did a review on. Um, but as for the third act where it takes place, from what I heard is after around the middle of the second season where they defeated the Digimon Emperor, um... That was the segment I really didn't follow, because, of course, I wasn't a huge fan of the second season, um, when you, I compare it to the first season, and, of course, you got TK and Matt in the United States meeting the American Digi Justin, um, Willis, I believe is his name was, and, of course, he has this Digimon that is not following his control as he used to, but I really did not follow it as much, because... It was said some of the new Digi Destins, like I believe it was Davis, that was one of them, um, felt like, like obviously of course Ty named him like his successor, but I didn't really thought like any of the three new Digi Destins and the older versions of TK and Carter were not as interesting when they compared to their younger forms. Um, yeah, and of course ending with All Star <laughs> in the end of the film. Like, that's kind of weird with Sh the Shrek connection. But, yeah, I thought it did better with Shrek instead of Digimon the movie. But, I haven't seen Digimon the movie in a while. And, I don't know if it has a, a recent... DV I know it has a DVD release, but I don't know if it has... I looked and there's no Blu-ray release, but... I don't know when I'm going to revisit that movie again. Probably only for its second act. Um, but that was a movie I really connected through much throughout the VHS, like, in even the preview of the first season, in, in its first episode. Number two may be a bit of a shock here, because if you have seen in one of my Macy's Parade Balloons episodes, um, this is surprising that he is not number one. And since I was born in the year when this movie came out, I was seven months old. Thomas and the Magic Railroad. So, yeah, it might be a little bit of a shock that it, this is Thomas is not number one. Um, and I was surprised years later that the critics did not like this movie. Um, and, of course, Thomas was my number one um, show I grew up with the most. Um, the classic era, of course. And a little bit during the new series era when it was on PBS Kids. Um, but, of course, this was... The plan to be Brent Allcroft's biggest passion to bring Thomas to a whole new level after the passing of Wilbert Audrey. Uh, but of course, it ended up being a big trouble in production through American test audiences, from what I heard, and almost making an Americanized version of this. So it's kind of sad because the production is the like the production history of this movie is more interesting than the movie itself because. When I'm looking at the movie now, um, you, of course, got Al Baldwin, who at the time was the season 5 and season 6 narrator for Thomas, um, was in between that. He did Mr. Conductor, which, of course, a lot of British audiences would not get because Shining Time Station was the show that brought Thomas to the United States in 1989, which had Ringo Starr as the first one, then George Carlin took over, and, of course, they ended after when George... Um, after season four in terms of the TV series episodes. Um, and then, of course, Baldwin. Someone in specifically only for this movie. 
And then, of course, got Mara Wilson her, in her last acting role during her childhood days, and the late Peter Fonda. And it's very interesting that he's in this movie, um, which is kind of surprising. And the casting, obviously, except for the Japanese dub of Thomas, this was the first time to have English voice actors. Um, and even Michael Angelis, who was the UK narrator, was supposed to voice Percy and James, but since they were too old for them, um, it kind of makes sense why they went and had women doing the voices for the characters. Um, the current voice for Thomas um, that was in this final result of the film um, is not actually that bad. And, of course, Diesel 10 doing like this, uh, obviously calling his um, call Pinchy. And I can see why some British critics consider it Americanizing the movie, kind of like what Disney, when they reacted to Disney with Alice in Wonderland and Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree. But it still hold a fond memory in my heart, um, because this was, like, Thomas was my thing. And, of course, this year does mark the 75th anniversary of the franchise. Um, earlier this month, this movie is finally getting a Blu-ray release. Um... I don't think sadly won't come with the director's cut, unfortunately. That's, like, we want to see the director's cut because I actually did read the original script, and at first glance, it's almost the same movie, but there's a lot of different aspects. It's just what it looks like I want to see. Um, and, of course, um, with the amount of Thomas merchandise I had throughout the toys, including the wooden railway forms, which are up in my attic right now since... I know that's bad, but they're in neatly packed boxes. I know that's kind of sad, but <sighs> yeah, that's the thing because I was never planning doing uh, Thomas content on my channel. Um, but of course, you got a lot of DVDs and VHS that I still have down here. Even going as far as owning a Blu-ray of Blue Mountain Mystery, which I believe was the last Thomas DVD slash well now Blu-ray thing that I ever got um, until when, of course more the power of youtube came along and um the thing is i'm like i still have all of them and it's very interesting like to see how this franchise has grown from a classic book to a big world big adventures garbage like i did watch some of the episodes um to see how they mattel and the united nations change it and oh my gosh we're that's not good, people. Like, it's just the the animation's not that well. Just why, Mattel? Why? You're Americanizing the show again. Like, what many people criticize as what this is an Americanized version of Thomas, so. But with that said, little engines can do big things, and little kids can do big things when you grow up watching this movie. And for number one, it's a Pixar movie. What else can you say? And this one, I had the biggest connection to, more than Digimon the movie, more than Thomas and the Magic Railroad. And that was, of course, through its VHS. And I did not get this DVD until years later. My number one childhood movie is Toy Story 2. Um, might be a little shock it's not the first one, but this one I had the more connection to it more than any other movie out there because... This was such a phenomenal follow-up to the original classic. Um, and of course, I did not get this DVD till years later, and looking at the DVDs during the later half of my childhood, great behind-the-scenes stuff, but the VHS was the one I really connected to the most, because every time when I played the Toy Story 2 VHS, it would start up with the previews with Disney's California Adventure, then, I believe it was the trailers for The Emperor's New Groove and Dinosaur. I think there was a home media release. Um, I forget what it was. Oh yeah, Fantasia 2000. That's what it was. Um, I think there were some others, but I don't remember. And then, of course, the teaser to Monsters, Inc. And then they played the short from Luxo Jr., which definitely is a classic Pixar short. And then they played this movie. And from beginning to end, I did not skip this scene. Even, I would have probably skipped the When She Loved Me, you would think I would skip the When She Loved Me sequence. I did not skip that at all. Everything in this movie is so perfect in any way, shape, or form. Yes, of course, the animation looks dated, and of course, one of the outtakes, they decided to remove it because of, well, 
the controversy. <laughs> and of course, yeah, I know it's weird having a John Lasseter movie um, being my number one childhood movie, but like I said, you can't change past events, unfortunately. Um, even though some people want to, but you just gotta deal with it. But it's just, this is a classic, I mean. Like, and of course, obviously I watched all the bloopers in the end credits, stay to the end credits, and then let's watch the, um, Raiders in the Skies music video, and I think they ended up with the previews of Buzz Lightyear's Star Command, The Adventure Begins. Um, yeah, that VHS, which unfortunately I don't have anymore, had the biggest connection to me throughout my childhood days. And, like, all the characters, the great story it had, no wonder why Toy Story 2 is going to be considered my number one childhood movie. So that will be it for my top ten childhood movies. Um, it's very interesting that Toy Story 2 would be my number one. So, 20 years of my life. Um, if you like this video, you can hit that subscribe button. Uh, comment down below what were your top 10 childhood movies, or do you have any recollections at any of the movies that I have mentioned? Well, 11, since there was the tie with Molly Welcome Charlie. And maybe there could be more um, childhood uh, top 10 lists I could do, but we'll just have to wait and see. But with that said, thank you guys for watching. And stick around for more content in the future.